We have a spectacular turnout today with about 260 people registered. I wanna recognize U of I System President, Tim Colleen and Executive Vice President and former LAS Dean, Barb Wilson in the audience. Thank you for attending and thank you all of you for your attendance today. As I said, this is the second LAS Dean's Distinguished Lecture. My predecessor, Dean Feng Shang Hu, launched this lecture series in October of 2019. He gave me the honor of being the inaugural speaker. So much has happened in our world and in our college since then. And now here I am as interim dean, introducing our second speaker, Professor Rana Hogarth. Don't worry, Rana, you do not have to become dean after giving this talk. So much has happened in our world over the past 13 months, especially the global pandemic and the intensified movement for racial equity and social justice in the US. At their intersection, the pandemic has exposed the long-standing inequities in healthcare that have resulted from structural racism. America has a long history of inequality when it comes to access to and quality of medical care and behavioral genetics, the science that forms the backdrop for today's lecture, figures prominently in this disgraceful story. As some of you know, my laboratory studies genes and behavior, and in years past when I taught the genes and behavior course, I would begin by telling the students that by spawning eugenics, behavioral genetics is one of the scientific disciplines that has done the most harm to people. This is a legacy of shame, and the way to overcome this is to ensure that we understand both the flawed scientific thinking as well as the historical roots in which this thinking took shape. Today, Professor Hogarth will tell us about the history of this inequality. She will discuss the insightful historical analysis analyses she has done that show that ideas dating all the way back to the era of slavery shaped scientific knowledge production on this topic and how these thoroughly discredited ideas sadly still negatively impact people in America today. As we are now on the threshold of being able to use genome editing to alter our traits, there's an even greater need to understand this history. Jennifer Doudna, one of the no winners of the Nobel Prize this year for the new genome editing tools, has been a strong voice for ensuring that humanistic ideals and knowledge are brought to bear on this explosive subject. And we have to be sure not to repeat the tragedies of eugenics. Professor Rana Hogarth is one of the leading scholars on the historical roots of eugenics and inequalities in healthcare. She is well positioned to guide public discourse on this history and what it teaches for our current situation. Her recent appearance on C-SPAN's Washington Journal program attests to her prominence and her willingness to engage as a trusted public intellectual. Professor Hogarth is an associate professor in the Department of History. Her training speaks to a long-standing commitment to multidisciplinarity. This is a scholar who's had a broad vision for a very long time. Professor Hogarth holds a PhD in history with a concentration in history of science and medicine from Yale University and a master's of health science in health policy from the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is the author of Medicalizing Blackness, Making Racial Differences in the Atlantic World 1780 to 1840. Professor Hogarth is an award-winning teacher, scholar, and researcher. We're honored that she is part of the LAS community and so pleased to have her deliver the 2021 Dean's Distinguished Lecture today. Welcome, Rana. Thank you very much for this very generous um, introduction. Um, and thank you all for sharing your Thursday afternoons with me. Um, what I will do now is I'm going to share my screen and um, I will take you through some of my research um, into uh, science, slavery, and the eugenic impact. So without further ado, um, I want to just uh, give a little bit of a content warning for my audience. Um, and I do that because um, the terms Negro, racial hybrid, miscegenation, and mulatto will appear in my talk today. 
Um, those words only appear to stay in keeping with the terminology of the historical context that I'm studying. I do not assume that anyone whom Davenport or any other eugenicist construed as a Negro or mulatto or hybrid actually exists today. So again, um, this is purely to stay in historical context. Um, and my use of these terms is in no way an endorsement. So my presentation today is going to draw um, heavily from my second book project, which I've been um, at work on. Um, and that is uh, tentatively titled Measuring Miscegenation, the Legacies of Race of, of Slavery and Eugenic Race Crossing Studies. Um, what I want to do, um, just for the sake of clarity and context, is just give you a little bit of an overview of what this uh, project will do, um, some of the um, interventions, basically why I'm doing the thing that I'm doing. Um, and then I want to uh, share some of these um, exciting findings from the archive. Um, I was very lucky to uh, spend some time um, at the um, archives at Harvard at the Peabody looking at some papers of Hooten and Carolyn Bondé, who I'll talk about in a minute, and also the American Philosophical Society um, looking through Charles Davenport's papers. So um, after this um, discussion, this will lead us um, into the Q&A. Um, and I will say just uh, for folks who, who don't know, it's, it's true, I'm a historian, but I'm really excited to engage with non-historians today. Um, and I should say that I, I do indeed have, um, uh, I guess, a very keen and also lifelong commitment to understanding the construction of race through the language of medicine and science. Um, and so you'll see a blending here of African-American history, but also the history of medicine um, and the history of science. So um, essentially in working on um, the first book, I had a lot of questions um, that I felt that I'd answered pretty well about the idea of how white physicians and slave societies um, circulated medical knowledge about blackness. Um, and so as in answering these questions though, I realized that I had uncovered more questions that required um, further study. So for example, I wanted to understand um, the idea of pathologizing and reifying uh, mixed race bodies, um, specifically people with black and um, white ancestry. I wanted to know how scientists and physicians tried to quantify the racial makeup of a mixed race person. Um, how was their fitness assessed? Um, when did this process begin in earnest? And what was the scientific logic behind it? And of course, what did slavery have to do with this process? So my interest um, in the precision methods to quantify blackness led me to eugenic race crossing studies, um, particularly those of Charles B. Davenport, the Harvard trained biologist who became one of America's uh, leading eugenicists in the early 20th century. Um, and I will say that Davenport's preoccupation with so-called black and white hybrids um, is a point of entry into a much larger investigation into the ways um, that anti-blackness uh, kind of left over from the days of slavery actually endured and informed 20th century studies on racial fitness. So basically what I'm trying to do here is to show how this lingering anti-blackness um, informs investigations, the research questions, the regard and how um, the uh, eugenicist or anthropologist looks at the mixed race person's body. Now I wanna be really clear here um, in saying that while I am going to talk a lot about um, Davenport and other white eugenicists, I do want to be clear that um, African Americans were also very much um, kind of involved in eugenic era discourse. Um, they were keenly aware of the ways in which slavery and racism framed the development of supposedly dispassionate scientific research into their health and their physiques. Um, so what I do try to do in this overall research is to actually position somebody like Charles Davenport with figures like um, Carolyn Bondé. Um, who was also trained at Harvard, much like Davenport. She was a student of Ernest Hutton, um, and she was an African-American anthropologist. Um, and she actually published her own study, um, a study of some Negro white families, so mixed race um, studies, in 1932. And I actually argue that this African-American woman was actually kind of challenging someone like Charles Davenport with her own research. Um, and what I find is that instead of sort of showing um, miscegenation or, or racial mixture, as this um, public health hazard, she actually worked to celebrate and underscore the great civic intellectual accomplishments of mixed race people. So um, as you can see, I wanna make this more of, of a dialogue, of a discussion of sort of um, what uh, African-Americans and white eugenicists were, were, were thinking about and talking about with respect to racial mixture. Um, so I wanna just say a little bit about the rationale of this research. Right, so um, you know, as a historian, I feel like I should be really transparent. Like, why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Uh, well, one, because I actually love it. 
Um, and two, because I think there is much to be said about how we can shift conversations um, about eugenics and the history of eugenics. Um, I'd like to think about ways of um, reframing who the targets of eugenic era policies were. So um, scholarship on eugenics um, in the United States um, typically frames it um, correctly as a misguided scientific response to imagined threats to the public health that largely derived from marginalized groups such as um, poor whites, immigrants, or differently abled people. Um, many of these people would eventually become white, um, and which is fine, and, and it, this is important um, scholarship, but I wanted to think about ways in which um, eugenicists actually targeted African Americans, a group that has actually been less well covered in the historiography of early 20th century eugenics. So I'm not talking about um, the horrific um, involuntary sterilizations that took place later in the 20th century specifically talking about the early 20th century. And so in doing so, I am focusing on um, context of slavery, emancipation, uh, reconstruction, and the nadir of race relations, and thinking about those contexts as actually being the lenses through which eugenicists viewed people with African ancestry in the Americas. Um, and so as I said before, I do want to engage with um, African-American responses. Um, and there is actually um, really good work, I would say, um, about how African-American thinkers, elite thinkers, um, try to appropriate and sort of use the language of race betterment um, for racial uplift. So um, elites like W.E.B. Du Bois pictured here um, and Dr. Rebecca Crumpler, for example, were early adopters of the idea of um, mating well um, and sort of trying to better the race in this regard. So there's a sense of hereditarianism going on here. And that is the belief that heredity um, plays a role in determining human nature and character traits. So the idea that things like thrift could be passed down um, as, as a heritable trait um, or laziness or criminality in, in some cases. The other thing that I wanna do with this project, why I'm doing this is that um, I, I do find that when we talk about eugenics, it's very easy to dismiss it um, as simply, you know, Davenport's really flimsy attempts at applying Mendelian genetics to humans um, he kind of goes from, from plants and then um, from like chickens and roosters and then sort of goes right to, to people. Um, and, and he literally does this in some of his lecture notes, just kind of goes right into to people. And um, while it's true, um, that does make up uh, the bulk of some of this um, logic, I was interested in studying the tools, other tools that eugenicists use to assess racial fitness. And in particular, I'm interested in anthropometry or the science that defines physical measures of a person's size, form, and functional capacity. Um, and I should say that anthropometry um, has its own very long and interesting history. Um, so for example, we could look at um, the US Sanitary Commission study of black and white soldiers, um, investigations of the military and anthropological statistics of American soldiers. And that's published in um, 1869. And this study actually uses anthropometry um, in a section where they assess black troops fitness. Um, and it actually, this, this study becomes a clearinghouse of data on, on these men. Um, so it's, for me, I, I really, again, want to say, yes, we know about the whole um, Mendelian piece, and we know that they were actually quite wrong. Um, and I would actually argue in Davenport's time, um, his contemporaries sort of pointed out um, that he was quite incorrect with some of his conclusions. Um, here, I'm thinking specifically of William Castle. Um, but I want to sort of think about more about anthropology and anthrop uh, anthropometry. The last thing I want to do, and what I'll talk about a lot today, is connecting slavery and the eugenic impulse to study race. Um, and, and this one is, is a little bit, um, it's a little bit thornier, but I think a lot more exciting and interesting in some regards. Um, because what I want to do is say that, um, well, yeah, the eugenic impulse to study mixed race people um, has a lot to do with um, the days of slavery and the kind of pervasive um, ideas about blackness that existed. So I would actually say that eugenicists um, really had a lot of easy access to damaging ideas about black people because those ideas had just accrued over centuries of slavery. So they were essentially spoiled for choice when it came to trying to locate data that would fit a narrative that showed black people to be inherently inferior and um, mixed race people to also be um, equally as inferior or in some cases, as far as Davenport is concerned, worse. Um, ultimately, these eugenicists saw the heritability um, of black traits as a liability. And they, and by using this language of heritability, I'm doing two things here. So I'm actually trying to access the notion of the historical residue of blackness as a heritable status that might mark a person as enslavable, but I'm also using heritable to signal the passing down 
of so-called constitutional and physical features. Um, and these kind of physical features had been legitimized and reified by naturalists and physicians. So um, for the historians in the audience um, um, and those who maybe focus on uh, the construction of race, what I'm trying to do here is kind of marry the concept of hypodescent or the one drop rule with the concept of partis sequitur ventrum, which is the concept that held that the offspring of an enslaved black woman would follow the status of the enslaved black woman that would be a slave. And doing so allows me to understand um, how constellations of ideas about blackness that existed during the era of slavery um, actually endured and became the scaffolding for building eugenic logic about racial mixture, purity, and fitness. So in other words, I would say that slavery's ghost continued to haunt the halls and meeting rooms where eugenicists gathered to brainstorm ideas about how best to study racial intermixture. And here, for example, is just um, a letter from Charles Davenport to Dr. R.J. Terry, um, and this is in regard to the Committee for the Study of the Negro, which is something that, um, so through a number of um, charitable organizations funding um, specific agencies like the National Research Council, there was a genuine push to say, let's try and study the so-called problem of the Negro. And you would gather together anthropologists, leading biologists um, in these rooms. And you'll see here on the next page, Davenport writes in this letter, we should probably try and look into where in Africa our quote slaves came from so we can properly assess um, sort of their, their fitness and, and their, um, their genealogies. So um, I think it's very clear, um, at least in my eyes, that slavery has much to do with um, Davenport's Javin, research trajectory. This comes um, very clear when we look at his um, race crossing studies. So he publishes um, two very well-known ones, the 1913 study, Heredity of Skin Color in Negro White Crosses, and his 1929 follow-up study, Race Crossing in Jamaica. Um, and in both, Davenport actually spent time addressing hearsay about mulatto bodies, such as um, mulatto infertility and preoccupations with their physical features. Um, so for example, he spilt much ink detailing the curl patterns of mixed race people's hair. Beyond that, um, slavery influenced his approach to collecting data. Um, this also, he also, it also influenced his research questions and his assumptions and his expectations about mixed race people's physical and mental capabilities. More to the point, um, he also understood that slavery created the material conditions that allowed his research to take place in the first place. And what I'm saying is, is that he understood that much of the uh, mixed race population and sort of generations of mixed race population would have emerged because of coerced sexual relationships between the races that would have taken place during the era of slavery. So I wanna say a little bit about um, some of the specific things Davenport says and what they mean for us today. In a 1917 article, Davenport declared mulattoes to be, quote, a nuisance to others, end quote. He surmised that these hybridized people were, quote, badly put together and ineffective, end quote. Now, this is not something that just he mentions offhand. It's actually published in the Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society. Um, and this is just one of many publications where Davenport outlined the danger that race crossing between Blacks and whites faced Americans. He continued, mulattoes, quote, combined something of a white man's intelligence and ambition with an insufficient intelligence to realize that ambition, end quote. Now, he doesn't explicitly state that uh, it's the Black ancestry of the mixed race person that's the source of the defect, but it is most certainly implied. Davenport was not alone in holding these anti-Black beliefs. Uh, beliefs. I would say that this fear of racial degeneration and equally troubling corollaries that that concept spawned reflected concerns of Americans um, over the changing demographic landscape of the country in the early 20th century. Um, so perhaps many of you are familiar with um, the uh, influx of immigrants at the Eastern, Western, and Southern borders between 1880 and 1920. And of course, many of us are well um, versed in understanding the movement of ex-slaves and their descendants into the North and Midwest in the early teens. Um, so this kind of forms the backdrop where we start to see eugenic legislation um, and anti-miscegenation laws, um, laws bearing um, interracial marriages, um, gaining a lot of traction. So I'll give you sort of a very familiar um, a bit of history um, that is sort of a reference to the race riot in Springfield, Illinois. Um, and you will see here that um, there are a number of factors that are responsible for this riot. But when we see how this is um, presented in the press, um, the claim is that um, multiple African-Americans uh, lost their lives. Um, many were lynched. 
And when one man was claimed that the reason for his lynching was because he had been married to a white woman. Now I should say he'd been married to this white woman for about 30 years um, without this happening, but um, this is sort of held up and bandied about as a, a major concern. Um, and you can see again at the bottom of this um, newspaper uh, clipping, the idea is to say that it's because of this race mixing that, that of course any mob would respond in this way. So again, you see here a clear shifting of the blame away from the violence of the white mob and blaming this on this idea of, of interracial um, marriage. So it's against this kind of a backdrop that someone like Charles Davenport um, is, is growing fascinated with race mixing um, and is pathologizing um, mixed race populations. Now I will say in, in, in doing this kind of study, he is of course drawing attention to the, the open secret of interracial sex that had carried on for centuries in the United States. Um, I should actually say in North America, in the Americas in general. Um, by homing in on black and white uh, racial hybrids, Davenport uh, actually tapped into this long um, history of contempt for black and white unions that had flourished under slavery and lingered well into the 20th century. So he, he kind of claims that this is a concern that's a new fear, um, that this, this growing concern of miscegenation. And one might be able to believe that if you were just to look at something like, say, the 1910 census, which there was supposedly a jump in the number of new lotters recorded. Um, I suspect, however, that definitional changes um, contributed a bit of mischief to this. Um, and that is to say that um, in 1870, the term mulatto included quadroons and octoroons and all persons um, having any perceptible trace of African blood. By the 1890 census, um, there was even more refinement. So this was the first and only census in which the terms um, uh, quadroon and octoroon were used as distinct categories in addition to mulatto. Um, and a mulatto was defined as somebody who had three eighths to five eighths black blood, a quadroon had one fourth black blood, and an octoroon had one eighth or any trace of black blood. Uh, unclear in the instructions though was how one was supposed to discern this other than just looking at the person. Uh, the terms that I, uh, these terms I should add only appeared in this 1890 census. So that by the time we get to 1910, we just see mulatto again, which likely would have subsumed all of these different groups of people. So I, what I'm saying is I don't think that there was a sudden um, uptick, like an explosion of more uh, so-called mulattoes um, in these census. Um, so uh, what Davenport does is he creates this problem or frames this as an emerging problem, and he decides to investigate mixed race people, but he claims he's there to sort of correct and, and, and uh, sort of expose the truth about these mixed race people. So he's not interested in listening to myths and lores. And in some cases, he does actually debunk claims that have been made about mixed race people. Um, and I will kind of go through some of these um, slavery era uh, myths that were actually still circulating um, in this time in the 20th century. I would also say that again, in doing this study, drawing attention to the long history of racial mixture, um, Davenport kind of found himself in a bit of a pickle in terms of where he was going to conduct his race crossing studies. As it turns out, he specifically says that it's too hard to do this in the Southern United States because people were less than forthcoming. Um, so what he does is he goes to the Anglophone Caribbean, which many people will say, oh, well, that's fine. They speak English there. There's a, this population he can use. It seems to make logical sense. But I would actually say that's just the surface. In reality, what Davenport does do is he's allowed to obliquely gesture to the historic role that white men played in race crossing by using these other and foreign locations, because it's easy for him to paint a place like Jamaica, for example, as a place that is economically stagnant, um, that sort of failed in its post-emancipation mission and is known for its lax cultural norms and high rates of illegitimacy. So we can say, oh, well, that's happening over there. And look what happens when race mixing goes on rampantly in these other spaces. But at the same time, we can all sort of understand that in terms of access to bodies and access to interracial mixture, um, what was going on in Jamaica and was going on in the Southern United States with respect to um, who is engaging in race mixing during the era of slavery is actually quite similar. So I wanna say a little bit about um, this myth making. What are some of these myths that, that Davenport was interested in debunking and studying um, as he uh, targeted the mulatto? So I'll think for example um, of a very uh, well-known claim about um, mixed race people being um, constitutionally weak. So a pro-slavery physician and editor of the Memphis Medical Journal, um, A.P. Merrill, loudly complained in 1855 
that the mulatto was, quote, less curable than white persons on account of his greater feebleness of constitution, end quote. Another commenter in 1834, uh, the British Gothic novelist and owner of several Jamaican plantations, Matthew Lewis, complained, quote, mulattoes are almost universally weak and effeminate persons, end quote. Even those opposed to slavery uh, would complain about the mulatto. Benjamin A. Gold, who was actually an astronomer but ended up working for the U.S. Genetic Commission, um, remarked in 1869, the well-known phenomenon of mixed race men, quote, inferior vitality, end quote. And I would actually say that um, after the Civil War, at least in the US context, what we start to see is the idea of um, African-American bodies, instead of them being ideally suited to hard labor and endurance, suddenly become um, sort of prone to all of these kinds of diseases, to per tuberculosis, et cetera. There are claims that their vitality is actually um, lower than whites. Um, and in some regard, Davenport actually cites Gould's work um, when talking about the values and benefits of um, anthropometry. So um, here, for example, is where um, in one of his articles on the measure on how to measure people, he cites um, Gould's uh, work. So in addressing the hardiness of mixed race people, um, Davenport has these incidental asides in his studies, right? Um, but I would actually argue these incidental asides suggest that in broaching the topic, um, he is willing to participate in a long project of assessing African descended people's bodily capability um, and engaging with ideas from the era of slavery. So for example, Davenport has his lectures and then some of these published studies where he talks about the mythology um, about mixed race people. And he notes um, that several of these commentators, well-known commentators are responsible for spreading some of this lore. So I'll give you an example um, from Edward Long from 1774. Yes, we're going back that far in time. Um, but Long was um, an Anglo-Jamaican planter and he commented, quote, it was extraordinary that two mulattoes should be unable to continue their species, the women either proving barren or their, or their offspring, if they have any, not attaining to maturity. The subject deserves a further and very attentive inquiry, end quote. Well, further and attentive inquiry it received because um, Long would be pleased to note that Josiah C. Knott, um, who was a pro-slavery physician um, in the South, actually heeded this call for attentive inquiry into the mulatto. Um, he actually, not actually credits Long as a high authority on the subject. So as you can see here, this is an 1843 article, quote, the mulatto, a hybrid, probable extermination of the two races if the whites and blacks are allowed to intermarry, end quote. And not actually cites Long, he says Eastwick and Long, who are high authorities in their histories of Jamaica, both assert unhesitatingly that the male and female mulatto do not produce so many children together, end quote. Not also observed that they had a host of other physiological problems, including shorter lifespans than either whites or blacks, and women plagued by, quote, physiological delicacy and an inability to con conceive children, end quote. Now, not and long lived in the era of slavery. They probably had very good reason to hope that mulattoes would go extinct simply because their very existence um, basically destabilized the racial hier hierarchies in which they lived. But I would say that um, after the end of slavery, the, the way that the mulatto is viewed changes because here we see this potentially extinct figure. And with Davenport, he turns the mulatto into a potentially threatening one. So for example, um, in the heredity of skin color in Negro white crosses, Davenport observes that there was absolutely, quote, no support in our data for the notion of a lack of fecundity between Negro white crosses, nor of their deficient viability. And in doing so, he actually calls out Long from 1774 and not from 1843 for their claims for propagating this mythology. Now, I will say, just because he's willing to say, well, that's not true, they, they obviously are fecund, um, that doesn't mean that he's trying to rehabilitate mixed race people. Um, in fact, when he, it seems that he's trying to pay a compliment, it's not that at all. So in one of his race crossing lectures, uh, Davenport went on to say that, um, quote, uh, the uh, mulattoes inherited some degree of physical robustness from their black parent. For example, quote, the Negro has uh, more advantages in physical quality over the white. He's less apt to suffer from goiter, obesity, deaf mutism, and deafness. The mulattoes show some excellent physical qualities of the Negro, end quote. But I should be clear here that when it comes to uh, thinking about the notion of hybrid vigor, 
Davenport says no. Um, and indeed, he has no qualms in noting that mulattoes have, quote, an extraordinarily high rate of tuberculosis, and the venereal disease rate is several times higher in them than among the whites. So here, instead of them sort of going extinct, he has them as being perfectly fecund, but also vectors of disease and potentially public health menaces. Um, and that he's saying that they're acquiring uh, these so-called good traits from um, their Negro parents, um, I would caution us to remember that um, at this time, um, Black people were assumed to be inherently tubercular, so close, uh, very um, susceptible to tuberculosis, and were also um, uh, had negative associations of hypersexuality attached to them as well. So I think here specifically of um, Frederick L. Hoffman's um, The Race, Traits, and Tendencies of the American Negro, which was published in um, 1896. And yes, Davenport and Hoffman did in fact correspond um, and were friendly with each other. So again, it, it's not surprising um, to, to sort of maybe have a little bit of scrutiny and say, I don't think that Davenport has such a very high esteem necessarily for um, uh, African Americans. I think he, like many others in the time period, believed that they were prone to certain kinds of um, illnesses and weaknesses. Okay. So I want to then kind of move on to, to, to matters of physical appearance. Um, so again, if we think about um, Edward Long, who I, I should say, he wrote a three volume um, history of Jamaica. So there's no shortage of um, ideas from this person. Um, but he actually went through and scrutinized the mulatto's physical features. So he writes, for example, the mulatto, quote, they seem to partake more of the white than the black. Their hair has a natural curl. In some, it resembles the Negro fleece but in general, it is of a tolerable length. Now, um, this is Long's statement, and you might think, well, this seems to be a bit trivial. You know, it's just a commentary on hair. But I would say that Davenport actually diligently studied the texture of mixed race hair. Um, in many of the family pedigree analysis, analyses he published in his 1913 study, he noted the color, length, and texture of mixed race hair, and indeed, the Eugenics Record Office, founded by Davenport in 1910, housed data collected from families, some of which included actual human hair specimens pictured here. So for example, in a dossier of the McDonough family tree that was sent to the ERO, the Eugenics Record Office, there were several hair samples from the mother, father, two of the daughters, and two other family members. Now, I still do not know how or why hair samples from the McDonough family who was a mulatto family from Jamaica who resided in the parish of St. Anne, had their hair end up in the eugenics record office. But the mere presence of these samples underscores an obsession with tying specific phenotypes to race. So for example, Davenport poses the question in his 1913 study, in how far is the absence or presence of Negro skin pigment associated with the absence or presence of other Negro characteristics? Are the true traits that are associated with dark pigmentation of the skin in the Negro, of which we can trace the association in the offspring of hybrids, namely color of the hair and form of the hair, the degree of curving, end quote. So he basically um, suggests later on that, quote, black skin color and woolly hair are closely associated in the pure red Negro, end quote. So he says that it seems that this association is accidental. He continues though to uh, associate quote, kinky or woolly hair as a typical quote, Negro trait. So in his studies, he would say, one subject from Bermuda had quote, typical kinky hair, no known white blood, end quote. Another subject was described from Jamaica as being quote, pure black with typical eyes and hair, end quote. And yet another subject from Louisiana was described as having quote, typical Negro features, a flat nose, thick lips, woolly hair, woolly and kinky hair, end quote. So put bluntly, Davenport indeed uh, tried to find out how much these typical Negro traits would be manifest in racial crosses with one black and one white parent. Um, and what he actually concludes is that um, light-skinned offspring from black and white parents would not necessarily have straighter hair than say their darker skinned siblings. Um, and I will say that this obsession with um, studying the texture of mixed race hair is not just the purview of Davenport. Uh, Carolyn Bondé, for example, in her study of mixed race families um, was able to um, secure similar types of hair specimens in mixed race families. Um, I will also add, um, as has been documented by other historians, in cases of trying to determine an individual's um, racial identity in court cases, um, hairdressers 
were sometimes called in as expert witnesses along with physicians who were supposed to be able to just sort of understand through observation and know uh, the different kinds of hair textures. Okay, so Davenport, in addition to thinking about this vitality, about thinking about physical um, uh, features, was also very much interested in understanding so-called mulatto intelligence. Um, and now there was a very uh, common claim about mulatto's supposed intermediate intelligence between whites and blacks, um, and this was certainly a target of Davenport's research. Um, this belief was very common in slave societies. So um, I'll give you a quotation from 1852 that I think um, uh, really exemplifies this belief. And this is from an agricultural journal from the South. Quote, it appears at all events certain that the mixed race exhibits powers more susceptible to cultivation than the pure African. They are selected in the South for the performance of duties requiring higher capacities than are possessed by the mere field Negro. Every day's observation shows that the mulatto is endowed with mental gifts superior to his black brother, end quote. Davenport, however, was completely unconvinced that mulattoes had any kind of edge. In his 1929 uh, race crossing in Jamaica, Davenport conducted a series of intelligence tests with his subjects, and he uh, did concede that there were cases where mulattoes were in between blacks and whites with respect to their scores. But he saw in mulattoes the potential for a very wide variation. And according to Davenport, they were prone to having individuals of unusually low intelligence in their group in relations to whites or blacks. So he sums it up in this uh, uh, 1929 lecture on, on race crossing in Jamaica, where he says, quote, about 5% of the Browns received lower scores than any of the blacks or whites. The difference in test is not always the same individual who thus scores extraordinarily low. The result is not due merely to the chance inclusion of the Browns of some individuals of very low intelligence. Rather, among the various Browns are some individuals who find themselves quite unable to even make a beginning on certain mental tests. There are fewer full-blooded Blacks who show such complete incapacity. It seems reasonable to ascribe this idiosyncrasy of the Browns to their hybrid nature." End quote. Now, the tests that Davenport uses are uh, so-called Knox moron tests or the Knox imitation cube test and army alpha test. Um, he also uses the mannequin test where he has the subject assemble um, sort of the figures of a person and how long they can draw a circle. I think they have like 30 seconds to do this. So a series, a battery of tests. So for Davenport, it was hard data and not hearsay about the supposed intermediate intelligence of um, mulattoes that uh, undergirded his approach to, to assessing them. Um, so, I want to then, just for the sake of time, move on um, to Davenport's uh, discussions of sort of how mulattoes came into existence in the first place. So I like to say it's sort of that thorny issue of paternity and the past. So Davenport was convinced that racial intermingling was widely occurring in the United States, even more so. But I would argue that this notion of immediate racial intermingling was actually a projection of collective white fears about black men preying upon white women. In reality, interracial unions had historically involved white men and black women. And in slave societies, white men had far more access to enslaved women's bodies. So in the United States, I would argue, even after slavery's demise, I think white men were still able to gain more access to black women's bodies. Tragically and deliberately, the narrative whites chose to adopt was that of black men using their newly found freedom to attempt sexual liaisons with white women. Now for Davenport, one of the issues he had to contend with was how mixed race populations came into existence in the first place. But he had to be very, very careful about this to his American audiences. So what he did, as I said, is he went to the English speaking Caribbean, he conducted his race crossing studies, and there he was able to interview people um, or have his assistants interview um, people. And he relied heavily on family histories um, by talking to Jamaicans and other inhabitants of the Caribbean islands. Um, he had a lot of detailed data co collection on these mixed race families. And in that data, it revealed that a number of the fathers listed in his genealogies were white. Now that said, um, the correspondence from his study collaborators and subordinates shows that Davenport tried to craft a kind of narrative that played into perceptions of black, about black female sexuality um, and only subtly implicated white men. So for example, letters Davenport wrote to his co-author Morris Stigurda explicitly stated the need for photographs of contrasting skin color. Quote, don't forget the disharmony. 
One problem I might suggest, that of colored children from past for white parents. Are there such? If so, mail the case with photographs and assurances of the trustworthiness of the mother with respect to paternity, end quote. Now at the time, uh, Morris DeGerda was a young graduate student here at the University of Illinois in the Department of Zoology. And he was very eager to impress Davenport because it turns out Davenport wrote him that letter of recommendation he needed to get a position at Smith College. So in another instance, Davenport wrote to uh, Stigurda, quote, it is very important to get some genetical data from every one of the 200 Negroes and mulattoes. Find out if they have lighter brothers and sisters in the presence of white ancestry, three generations, end quote. So clearly Davenport wanted to uh, get contrast in his data collection. And he wanted to do that because I think he understood that that could uh, send a message more strongly than just statistical measurements um, in charts. So the request for dramatic color contrast in family photographs, I would argue, highlight Whiteman's complicity in creating a class of mixed individuals. Davenport's photographs in Race Crossing in Jamaica consistently depicted disunified mixed race families. Even though he acknowledged white fathers in the text of his study and in his data collection, his raw data, in his letters to Segurda, Davenport asked for genealogical data involving, quote, mulatto children in which the mother is of full black blood or nearly so, and the father white. Now, as I said, he could get this data because he was in Jamaica. Um, and I will say that Carolyn Bonday was able to get data in the Southern United States, but I would argue that's because he was connected with many of the other uh, mixed race families in the South. And he also promised not to publish their names or any photographs um, beyond sort of just what was in her, her, um, in her thesis. Um, I think it is unclear if stigma or shame would have motivated the fathers of these mixed race children pictured here um, to, to abstain from having their photographs taken. Um, as I said, where he could, Davenport recorded white fathers who acknowledged marriage or cohabitation with the black women in his studies. But in these photographs here, the observer can only assume that the photograph light-skinned children were produced from the union of the photographed darker-skinned mother and the absent white father. In fact, in all of Davenport's photographs, of complete mixed race families, he references black mothers, mulatto mothers. However, in the case of fathers, they are referred to as very light-skinned or practically white, but never white. As a result, the role of white men in creating mixed race offspring remain conveniently hidden in plain sight. Um, as you can see, it's sort of a family. Here's the child, here's one parent. Where is the missing parent? So it seems to me that Davenport is selectively or selectively presented this data on mixed race families and made a forceful anti-race process message without explicitly pointing a finger at white men. The message conveyed through the missing white father conveniently fits the dictates of hypo descent. As I said before, this is the rule that meant that any degree of African ancestry was sufficient to classify the person as black or Negro. I would, I would suggest a variation on the slavery era concept of par de sequitur ventrum here as well. And that dictates that the child of the enslaved black mother and white man takes on the identity of the mother. Now, while these women are clearly not enslaved, they would have been enslavable in the past and therefore more likely to pass on their status to their offspring. In other words, their offspring would always have an ancestral mark of blackness. And Davenport was able to show this by only showing these parents with African ancestry and not the white parents. In a sense, these photographs of mixed race children and their darker skinned mothers are illustrative of white men's complicity by what they concealed and highlighted. So to conclude, the ethos of identifying specific characteristics in groups of people and comparing them to other groups for the purposes of understanding weakness and strength was a shared feature of the era of eugenics and the era of slavery. Eugenicists invested in making legible the strengths and weaknesses of different types of people via their inherited traits. One of the many lasting consequences of slavery then was rendering blackness as a legible, a legible physiological and phenotypic trait, and indeed in some cases for Davenport a liability. His race crossing studies shared with slavery era discourse a desire to pathologize black people's bodies by harping on their imagined physical peculiarities. His pathologization of the mulatto body should perhaps strike us as a very predictable corollary. Davenport refined and repackaged white supremacist ideas about the inferiority of black people by focusing on allegedly disharmonious results that occurred when black and white people reproduced together. He may have corrected some misperception about mulattoes, but this was not out of his desire to right past wrongs. Davenport transformed the mulatto from a benign and barren accident of nature to a dangerous mentally inferior hybrid. 
he rendered them a class of people that could stealthily corrupt the fiction of white racial purity with a taint of blackness that was hidden behind potentially white looking skin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hogarth, for that really insightful lecture. We are now going to turn to our question and answer period. And um, the way we'll do this is if you raise your hands in the Zoom function, which is under the reactions, then Ramey Ackerman, a member of the staff in the Dean's office, will call on you in the order in which you raised your hand. And uh, then she'll unmute you so you can ask your question. So please uh, proceed. May Baron Baum. Uh, okay, well, thank you for that brilliant and jaw dropping talk. Um, that is just absolutely perfect for this for this moment in time. Uh, the question I have is, it strikes me as odd that uh, uh, this uh, scholarly uh, investigation of of uh, uh, hybrid crosses in humans is exactly contemporaneous with studies in plant breeding showing that heterosis or hybrid vigor was an incredibly desirable condition that if you cross strains, you get a better seed corn. Uh, in fact, the first hybrid corn were marketed right about the time that Davenport was publishing uh, conceptually completely antithetical findings. How did they reconcile this or were they, did they just conveniently ignore it? So um, first of all, thank you very much for this question because um, I have tried to wrap my mind around this too. I followed his lectures um, on, on, on plants and then um, he kind of makes a leap when he starts to talk about animals. So what he does is he makes the claim by using, um, he actually uses chicken. So you'll have to excuse me that I can't find exactly like corn, the specific analogy here, but he uses chickens and uses the claim that if you take a chicken that is known for its ability to um, sort of sit on eggs for a very long time, and then another kind of chicken that, that doesn't have that trait, and if you breed them together, what will happen is the offspring, when it's their turn to sit on the eggs, will only sit on them for a little bit. They'll have some of that from the parent, but then they'll wander off and do something else, and then those other eggs will sort of die off. And so he's basically saying that the two bad traits or like one good trait wasn't enough to sort of improve this next generation. So he actually suggests, for example, with humans, that there are groups of people that have long legs and short torsos or long arms or short arms. And he says that, you know, in certain generations, what you're going to find is that it will be harder for them to pick things up off of the floor. And he quite literally publishes this in Race Crossing in Topeka gets completely embarrassingly um, just taken to task for it by every reviewer. Um, so to the point of like, why is he making this claim that, that nobody else is making at the time when they're looking at these models in, in plants is something that I suggest has more to do with this impulse of him thinking that race crossing, that specific kinds of races are prone to a, a kind of disharmony. Now I wanna be really clear here that he says that these are um, certain races that have sort of this wide variation. So he says that for some ethnic groups, right? So some white ethnic groups across with another white ethnic group might not be as bad. But when you take uh, wide varying races, which he would argue would be people of African descent, so um, black people and white people, there's, it's too much variation. And he says that it causes disharmonies. Now I'm digging more into um, some of the critiques from people like um, William Castle, um, and actually Carl Pearson writes a pretty rough review of um, race crossing in Jamaica to kind of understand um, why he went against this idea of hybrid vigor. I can actually think of um, in the last concluding section of race crossing in Jamaica, which is about like 500 pages, he basically has a sentence that says, there is no hybrid vigor between realms. Like that's it, that, that, that's all he has to say about that. So I do very much um, appreciate your question. And I think you're very spot on to think about the broader issue with um, plant um, and animal sciences. Other questions, Ramey, or should I ask mine? I don't see any other raised hands. Okay, well then uh, I'll take my turn. Um, and the question has to do with, it seems as though Davenport had an extraordinary influence on um, public opinion and uh, the boundaries between uh, science and society seem to be very blurred in his work. Um, is that 
uh, due to the topic of, of race or is that uh, something that you might contextualize as being more the case um, back then? I mean, we're having a hard time getting people to take vaccines right now. So we scientists clearly don't have as much influence as we uh, might need to, to help. And here's this guy spewing this stuff that uh, has so much um, influence. Um, yeah, so this is, um, I, I have to say that what I'm finding um, with Davenport, and, and of course, I, I imagine you must be thinking of the, the 1924 um, Johnson Reed Immigration Act, that that's like one of the most draconian restrictive immigration acts where um, congressmen are actually saying, oh no, we've listened to what the eugenicists said, and it's really good sound policy to have this terrible immigration act. Um, and I think even in Davenport's papers, um, you know, between him and Laughlin and others are like, yes, this is great. Have you heard the news? We're going we're gonna to restrict immigration because we have sound science to back up why certain groups of people are sort of bad for America, that it's not going to do well for the uh, so-called germplasm. Um, what I would say is that this anxiety that Davenport is tapping into has, has sort of been there. I would actually argue that the, the grumblings and complainings about um, the shifting landscape, right? The assumptions about races, some races being extinct and some races um, not going extinct as, as expected are on the tips of people's tongues or people are thinking about this. And Davenport is basically validating what a lot of people wanna hear. So when it comes down to saying, okay, I am trained in this and we have proof, right? Because if you remember the, the, the idea of like sort of understanding genes and, and what we know now, what we all take like sort of for granted is not quite there, it's like in early days. So like the idea of a gene is like, like 1909 is when like the idea of like what we would say is a gene is out there. So people are kind of going on, um, you know, less precision that we're used to. But I do think that Davenport is speaking a kind of language and using science and marshaling, marshaling science in a way that supports um, attitudes at the time. So I think, you know, now when we say, oh, we have experts that are trying to say, you know, we're trying to advise, we're trying to give guidance. I would actually say it's, it's less about the idea of experts and, and more about people saying that there's skepticism, that there's maybe a breakdown of trust of who you should listen to. So I think at that point in time, people would listen to someone like Davenport because they were saying what they wanted. He was saying what they wanted to hear. Right. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, up next, Chelsea Juarez. Oops. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I was having trouble to unmute myself. So. Your talk was amazing. And as I was listening to you, I, I should say, I should admit, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist. And um, so one of the things from your talk that particularly struck me was the hair samples that you showed. Um, and I was, I was thinking about, you know, as anthropologists, we are collectors of the, the body parts of people. And when I was looking at these hair samples, I wondered if, I wondered what role this, you know, the eugenics movement and, and the, the focus on hair and skin color and women had in the creation of this culturally pervasive idea of black women's hair being not acceptable in its natural state. And I wondered, I, I, I don't, I mean, you know, this is really coming from, you know, as I saw those hair samples, I just thought to myself, how othering it must feel to, to have a stranger come to you and, and want to cut off a piece of your hair to take it as a sample. And I just wondered if you could speak to that because it really, as I saw those hair samples there from, from so long ago, I realized that this has been going on, you know, forever forever when body parts of people are just being taken away and studied because you know they're being conceptualized as you know as wrong or as other so i really want to thank you for showing that picture and i wonder if you could just speak to that sure um so i think you're you're hitting on um something that um i think dovetails both with uh anthropology but i think also just in terms of for me as a historian that thinks about the history of the body um and that is the way in which um we have certain ways of thinking that we can make race legible. And so in some cases, people say, okay, well, skin color, I can just tell, I'll look at somebody's skin color. 
But if you're talking about mixed race people and Davenport has a whole section on so-called Casper whites who are the worst kind because you can't tell that they have black ancestry, but they do. And you have to be able to really discern and, and look and tell. And so hair is a way to kind of signal to say, oh, wait, that's how I can read you and mark you. It's kind of like making reifying this idea of race and, and reifying this idea of, of blackness by suggesting that there are these typical black traits. And I would argue you can go to the 18th century, I think even to the 17th century, where the language of wool is being used to describe black people's hair. It is almost universal to see this phrase wool as the descriptor of black people's hair. And I think that one, it, I, I cannot disaggregate this from a kind of animalistic description that is kind of to, to say, oh, it's not long, right? So for long, he, for Edward Long, he says it's of a tolerable length as if to say it's not that short wool. Everything is sort of around um, constructing an otherness of black features that is very distinctive from what the standard of white features are. And so I think for, um, particularly when we think about colorism and when we think about passing, what does it mean to have hair that favors white hair or what people might call good hair or those kind, that kind of language, which I really don't wanna really invoke, but that's kind of what's going on here, this evaluative um, reification of specific racial traits and features. And for, I would actually argue specifically to the point of anthropology, um, eugenicists rely a lot on what anthropologists are doing. I mean, they're always in conversation with each other. Um, and this idea of collecting, uh, Davenport borrows so much and relies so much from anthropological methods um, that it is sort of for him, it's his data, right? It's collecting his data and, and that's what gives it a sense of precision and a sense of truth, I think, for the people who buy into it. That you can say, oh, look, here's a hair sample from this person who is full-blooded black, which I don't even know what that means. And here's the person who has you know, some white ancestry. And look, can't you see the difference in the curl of the hair? Oh, you can't? Well, let me explain further. It, it's sort of a way of, um, yeah, basically trying to use and read the body, make legible ideas about race that are sort of constructed and, and tell them that there's a biological basis to them. And it's, I think it still very much lingers today, especially in how people talk about um, African-American women and African-American women's hair. Like the fact that we have new stories about obsessions with, with, with so-called natural hairstyles. Um, so, but thank you very much um, for your, your question. Next is Terry Barnes. Hi, hi everyone. Rana, thank you so much for your, for your, for your lecture. Um, I have two questions. I'll try and make them brief. The first is I was so struck, I, I mean, you, consistently talk about very carefully about black people and white people but I was struck by I think it was one of your slides with a with a letter from 1843 that talked about mulattoes and and negresses and that really brought home to me how the mulatto is was theorized as being male and so I was thinking about what difference does it make in these studies like words like I think fecundity refers to male and fertility refers to female. I was just wondering, you know, if the mulatto is consistently thought of as being a, having masculine, uh, you know, uh, characteristics, what, how does that carry through into these studies? Uh, 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 that was, um, I, I thought that. And then my second question is about uh, how many, is you, you also identified Davenport as being from Harvard, but I was wondering, is that where he worked? Did he have lots of graduate students? Was there a whole Davenportian network of knowledge production um, that followed him um, through the through the academy? Those are my two questions. Thank you so much, Rana. Sure. No, thank you very much um, for your questions, Terry. I appreciate it. Um, so for the first thing I will say is that um, what I've actually found, um, at least in references to mulatto discussions from both the 18th and 19th century, I've actually found a lot of um, focus on women, on, on, on mixed race women, um, less so than men. And, and simply because, um, at least for long, he's clearly like fetishizing and sexualizing them when he talks about, so when he says that their hair is of tolerable length, he goes on to discuss their attractiveness, their gait, they have an easy manner. It, it's kind of um, a little bit gross and fetishizing. And I think that the issue is, is that the blame on the continued racial mixture is on these 
mulatto women who are tempting white men to, to continue in this, this, this practice of racial mixture. Um, I, I do take the point about fertility versus fecundity, but I'm, I'm thinking back again to um, specifically Long's passage and his very de detailed description of the of mixed race people of, of mulattoes, and then specifically um, of a quote that I didn't have time to put in, um, which is from Louis Agassiz from the United States, where he complains loudly um, in a letter that young men in the South are corrupt, corrupted by getting so-called, quote, spicy partners because they are alert into this by the mulatto housekeepers or like women that work in the house. Um, but he doesn't explain where the mulatto housekeepers came from in the first place. Like he just suggests that they just appeared there just to corrupt white men. And it always is the discussion of like, oh, well, they're easy in their manner, but, and I find that it's a lot of it is just focusing on, on, on black women actually. But I will try and, and think a little bit more about the, the mixed race man. And I say this because um, there's a fantastic work um, by Martha Hodes um, specifically on a mixed race family, but it's actually a white woman who marries a, a mixed race man, a, a, I guess a mulatto man from Cayman Island. And I wonder, um, I probably might wanna look back and see how he is described just to get more clarity on that. Um, and then to the point of training, um, as far as I know, so Davenport, um, he kind of goes straight to Cold Spring Harbor and like that bounds the, the, the eugenics records office in terms of like training of grad students. Um, I, I don't recall seeing a, a ton of like Davenport followers per se, like he takes them under his wing like Stagurta. He writes letters for them. He actually um, suggests Carolyn Bond Day, who's like at, at Harvard as, as a potential member for the study of the American Negro. So I know he's like well connected and is probably seen as a person that can um, jumpstart the careers of young researchers in, in, in anthropology and, and eugenics. Um, but in terms of like um, his, his like, you know, famous students under him, um, I, I find that Morris de Goethe is probably the, the closest you're gonna find to a, a follower um, of the Davenport way of thinking. I'd also say by the time Race Crossing in Jamaica comes out, um, other leading geneticists, like Davenport's, he's, people are kind of trying to back away slowly from him. Um, because race crossing in Jamaica is so, I mean, it's poor science anyway, but it was like at the time, such poor science. Um, so thank you very much for your question, Terry. Bruce Rosenstein. Yes, thank you so much for a fabulous uh, presentation. Um, one quick uh, bibliographic comment and then uh, a, a question and a, and a little longer comment. Um, bibliographic, I just recall reading in Orlando Patterson's Slavery and Social Death, a point that he stresses about hair being perhaps even more significant a phenotypic distinguishing mark of the slave than indeed um, skin color. So you, it, it, it's an interesting point he's making. I was surprised by it, but now I'm, I'm no longer quite so surprised. Um, I, I, a comment, there's a parallel phenomenon to what you're describing happening in relation to Jews in the European sphere. So Houston um, Stuart Chamberlain in his Foundations of the 19th Century makes an exactly parallel case about the hybrid identity of the Jew. And precisely in light of the claim you just made that it's too distant a relationship to bear a productive child. That's exactly the claim he makes about the genealogical origin of the Jew, who is in fact, he argues, a combination of Aryan and Hittite types. Um, it's as bad a genealogy and as bad a science as your case is, but it's published in 1899. And unfortunately, it has an extremely deleterious effect because it's the it's been called the uh, the the he was the John the Baptist to Adolf Hitler. Um, so part of what is going on in the case of Houston Chamberlain is precisely an anxiety around a, a, a passing of the Jew in German culture, the inability precisely to maintain a Jewish, as it were, cordoned off social community that is religiously, culturally, 
linguistically distinct from the German people, um, as well as the English. He's, he's born as an Englishman, but he becomes uh, a German in his later in his later life. So I'm in I'm I just I bring that up not necessarily as a question, but as a significant parallel to the phenomenon that you're describing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next is um, Carla Sanabria Vaez. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Uh, hello, it, it's, pre it's pretty well, and, and I'm a linguist, so that's nice. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, um, Dr. Hoga, for your amazing presentation. Um, as a Puerto Rican myself, um, we also have our history, our deep history in eugenics during the 1970s and with the experimentation of the pill. And I like how um, like this historical analysis allows us to combine the influence of capitalism, racism, and colonialism because women were sterilized at the moment in time in Puerto Rico in which they were the only source of income of families. And alongside a very strong independence, pro-independence movement of Puerto Rico at the time. Um, my question is more related to like, what should we do in this moment in time? Um, particularly as a teacher, we, we know that um, things like standardized testing are deeply rooted in eugenics um, and as in academia and academic spaces, we keep using those um, measurements even though we claim to try and promote diversity and inclusion when we know that those instruments deeply um, disregard the contributions of Latinx and Black folks. So I guess my question in a larger term or in a larger term is, um, what can we do to abolish um, the legacy of eugenics and racism in academia? What can we do as scholars? What can we do as intellectuals so that this very important moment in time that we're living in doesn't um, shade away with time, but it's a, it's, it's a turning point for many people in this country because again, we deserve it, it's important. That's my question. Okay, um, thank you very much and a very timely question indeed. So, so what I can say is maybe I'll offer my, my um, thoughts as, as the historian, right? So I agree that there are many um, parts of our life, like sort of just that we don't think about that have deeply problematic and fraught historical origins, right? So to think about why is this question the way that it is or why is our approach to either testing of measuring, why is our standard this? Right? And in some cases, you're absolutely correct, and in certain standards that we use um, are favorable right, to, to either white or certainly unfavorable to non-white as not being the standard, right? um, as sort of being a group that is, will often fail to live up to this kind of a standard. So I think specifically of notions of like, what is considered to be the best vitality? Like, what is the measurement for that? What are you grading it against? And it's clearly inherently um, biased against um, non-white groups. So I would argue that in cases of education, particularly intelligence tests and thinking about the origins of some of these tests, um, for me, I would say, you know, tracing the origins and understanding, okay, what was, what was the actual research question? What was the regard that the person had in crafting and constructing this instrument, right, to the person who would take it? Who did they imagine to take it? Who did they imagine to succeed at it? And who did they imagine to not succeed at it? What was its function? And I think to ask these basic questions, and again, Please forgive my, my total disciplinary like response to this because I'm like, dig into the past, find the origins, put it out there and make it clear that people understand where this is coming from um, in order to affect that change now. Um, that's what I have tried to do when, when asking questions, right, about like things like race correction that physicians still use in decision making to say, by the way, if you use this barometer, it has race correction built into it. And the reason it has race correction built into it is not a good one. It's actually an assumption that black people have lower lung capacity. So now people are starting to say, maybe we shouldn't use those things anymore because they have a very fraught and problematic history and they are perpetuating, actually, I would argue, um, incorrect and wrongheaded beliefs and innate differences that naturally harm non-white populations. So I wish I had a better answer for like educational tools per, per se, but I think that that approach would be fine to, to sort of say, let's start questioning and, and be honest with it, to say, this is what this or originated from, and this is what the purpose it served. And if it's damaging and it has been harmful and it continues to perpetuate a legacy of harm, particularly for like black and brown people, stop doing it. So yeah, again, I do very much appreciate your question too. 
Hey, Ron, you're next. You're, you're muted. How is that? There we go. Hi. Hi, Ron. I want to thank you for a very, very enlightening talk. Um, and I want to follow up on a question similar to May Berenbaum's question, but I want to talk about institutional connections because it struck me, particularly when you showed the um, slide of hair and the American Philosophical Society, I think that was scribbled in small letters beneath. What struck me uh, was Benjamin Franklin and his very active role in the affairs of the Royal Academy of Sciences in London, where he spent, I don't know, almost 20 years there leading up to the American Revolution. And during that time, actually was the founder of the American Philosophical Society. And what I remember about his London involvement is that he was a very active scientist and experimenter, and he made sure that he brought back samples from the United States to share with people in London because there was a very active discussion going on about issues of race and so on. I mean, I'm, I was struck by his interest in um, mixed race people are trying to figure out about black skin color. Um, and it struck me that he was Franklin uh, in London, founded the American Philosophical Society. And then you start talking about um, Stegert and other people uh, who were connected to the Carnegie Institution. So I wonder what you see in terms of institutional connections around the perpetuation of these ideas about race and studies of race and sharing um, samplings of race mixture, mixture across the Atlantic, all connected with discussions about race, race inferiority, slavery, so forth and so on. Okay, so thank you so much for, thank you for, for listening and thank you for your question, Ron. So I'm Enjoyed gonna- it. I'm going to say a couple of things here, and, and maybe this will be like kind of bold and crazy, but here's the deal. I firmly do believe that discussions about othering and race and the construction of race was a large transnational ongoing process, exactly to the point of multiple institutions participating with a kind of shared understanding of the evidentiary base of having samples and specimens to prove and demonstrate the point. So thinking about the APS, for example, um, which is a very old and hallowed institution, um, you can find members who are, you know, we have Davenport founding with, with Franklin. You have um, people like Benjamin Rush addressing them with uh, papers about black skin as a form of leprosy. The idea of an intellectual society of groups of people gathering together with institutional support. And again, these are going to be the high regarded elite members of society. Being able to have a conversation about other and difference in race to me in and of itself is the interesting thing that you are a research question, that parts of your body are now subject to what is considered to be valid and legitimate discourse amongst well-trained elites is the thing that, that fascinates me. And particularly to this idea of trading in specimens of body parts, um, again, I, I am not a, a, an expert in sort of the material culture of like sort of bodily specimen, but I will say that there is indeed a robust um, historiography around the trading of body parts. So we can start with the 18th century and thinking about the um, enterprise to collect with Hans Sloan and the, um, sort of his curiosities. Um, we can also think about the philosophical, the American Philosophical Society. Um, we can certainly think about the ways in which physicians would trade in specimens, anatomical collections um, in the South using, again, black people's bodies, but an interesting case here, a specimen of a, of a tumor here. Um, this is the work, of course, of Stephen Kenny. So the idea here is to say that it is not surprising, I would say, in any way, shape, or form, that you have um, collectibles, right, that groups that are deemed as other, um, that have been subject to this kind of gaze, would have parts of their bodies being used um, as, as part of making a bigger point or being used as sort of, um, I guess you could say, a kind of intellectual spectacle, right, to prove a certain point. Um, and we can think also specifically of the display of actual live humans, right? So the idea of um, Black people who had what we think would, would have been vitiligo being put on display right. at fairs in London, in Europe. So people right. could say, look and behold for yourself. So I do very much appreciate um, 
this question that, yeah, I mean, I, I confess I wasn't expecting to see the hair at the APS because it wasn't in the finding aid. Um, it's now in the finding aid, but it's one of those things where, you know, at first you're like, my God, is this hair? And then you're like, oh yes, of course it is, because this is part of that enterprise. Um, so again, I, I, for just for sake of time, I would say um, thanks very much for your, your thoughts there, Ron. Last hand, um, Ripon Molly. Hi, Rana. Thank you so much for that very interesting talk. Uh, I, I was also um, struck by the hair samples and uh, these samples that Davenport um, and others have collected. I was just wondering about the, the fate of those samples uh, and where they are now. Have they been passed on to other scientists or they've been re returned to the communities or um, do we know? Yeah, well, so um, I, I inquired at the um, APS. So as I said, it wasn't in the finding aid. And I think the archivist was also kind of taken aback. So you have to understand, it was like a afternoon in June, like several summers ago, and I opened a package and hair fell out. And I really was not expecting that. It wasn't in the finding aid. I pieced together that that's this family tree. What I was told was that they were like, this is what was from the eugenics records office. They don't have any way of necessarily, as far as I could tell, nobody had try to trace back the family and say, okay, let's give these samples back. Um, I will say that from talking to other colleagues and friends that do this kind of work, hair samples are just, they're there. There hasn't been any attempts that they have heard of of it being given back to the people who sent them or if they were even voluntarily given. So I don't know, I assume that the postmark that says BWI British West Indies on the, on the envelope with this hair sample suggests that they voluntarily sent it. But, but the provenance is, is really, it's hard to know the, the specifics of it. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a question mark with that one. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have one more raised hand. Grace Eberhardt. Hi, um, I had a question. Um, I guess I've been thinking like globally, um, how did scientists receive um, Davenport's mixed race study? Um, just because I've been thinking about how like the definition of blackness has been really fluid and has been really, it's really different in the US versus like other countries. And then even like, like within states at that time. Yeah, so this is a very good question. So I will say this, um, there is a, so I think other than the convenience of, of picking the Anglophone and Caribbean, um, Davenport did correspond with um, a scientist from Brazil, and it was clear that they were on a different level of how race works, because as you can imagine, in Brazil, there's a very different approach to understanding racial mixture. Um, and I would actually argue that even for Davenport, having to deal with the so-called Browns, which is something that was an inter, there's sort of three-tiered racial system for um, places like Jamaica, for him, that was like a built-in way to say, oh, look, that's that's mixed race people. And they have it as an openly acknowledged like racial category that has been around for like forever. So I, I think that it was easy for him to understand that culturally and, and sort of that it was different in other regions of the Caribbean and South America and Latin America. So he's like aware, Davenport is very well much aware of the different categorizations. But I think that for the purposes of one, he didn't have that much money like funding to, to, to do this like a longer study. He also found that doing the Caribbean was, was easier just in terms of logistics. Um, but you're right that, that races, the idea of blackness is, it means different things. In certain cultures and countries, one could be black in you know, this time period and then within their lifetime could be designated as not. Um, so it all it kind of depends on that context. What I will say though, is that in terms of the international reception, of Davenport's work, um, you know, I think he started out, I would say, being well regarded. Um, by the time Race Crossing comes out in 1929, um, Carl Pearson, who's the British, um, the, the, I guess, biostatistician, if you for lack of a better term, um, Davenport and Pearson were at first friends, and then they fell out. And it was very clear that they fell out because um, Pearson disagreed very strongly with Davenport's approach to Mendelian segregation of certain traits. Um, and Pearson, if we were to take that as sort of the international reception, at least the British reception, just took him to task. Um, and it was just kind of um, poo-pooed uh, race crossing in Jamaica. Um, and then of course at home, uh, as I said, with William Castle poo-pooed it as well. I will say that there were, of course, you know, international eugenics conferences, right? 
so that, that Davenport did participate in like early on. Um, so he was of course speaking with eugenicists across the world and they all had their sort of different um, projects and groups that they were studying. But I would say that later on, at least um, from what I've determined, like once we start getting into the thirties, Davenport's international reputation, let's say, is, is, is not enjoying what it used to in the early decades of the 20th century, I would say. Thank you very much though for your question. Okay, well, I'd like to thank uh, Ramey Ackerman for masterfully running the question answer uh, on Zoom, but we're not finished yet. For those of you who've indicated an interest in joining a breakout room for further discussion, you've been pre-assigned to a room moderated by one of our associate deans or myself. When Ramey opens the rooms, you'll be asked uh, to join a particular room, click the blue join button, and you will be whisked away into your new room. Professor Hogarth will be circulating and visiting each and every breakout room to engage with you a little bit and perhaps answer a question that your group decides they want to ask her. I'd like to thank you, Professor Hogarth, for going above and beyond um, to do this uh, breakout session. And we, and we know members of the audience will enjoy the opportunity to meet with you for a few minutes. For those of you who indicated you did not want to join a room, but you've changed your mind, just stay uh, where you are and uh, Ramey will be happy to put you into a room. You're welcome to stay as long as you'd like in the breakout room. We won't be reconvening uh, after that. Just leave when you'd like. Um, so before we divide up, um, Rana, picture or, or imagine thunderous applause. We thank you for a brilliant lecture and um, the engaging question and answer period. Thank you so much for, for your lecture today. Uh, good afternoon to, to all of you and look forward to seeing a few of you in my breakout room. Good afternoon, bye-bye.